about uh, George Bush, the father who became president. The, the younger one is George W. Bush. Uh, when he was campaigning for re-election, which he eventually lost to Bill Clinton, the story says that they were actually in Texas and they were campaigning. They were in, in, in the countryside where not a lot of uh, people have actually gone. And there were several limousines and the limo that the president was riding on with Barbara, his, his wife, was there. And they began to move from town to town, little towns like this, until when they were, after they left one town, the driver of the limo, or the, pre the presidential limo, said, Mr. President, we're low gas. <clears throat> Did anybody else bring some extra gas? They were never prepared for it. And they're in the middle of nowhere. Oh, where is the gas station that we can go in right here? And, and as they were worrying, Barbara said, don't worry, I know a gas station here. Just follow this road, turn to the left on the next fork, and you will see a small rundown gas station. We can fill up right there. Will it be safe? According to the, the, uh, so the, the security, the, it'll be safe. I know the person who runs that place, Barbara said. And so they went. The guy came out, he began filling up the presidential limo, and when he got out, Barbara said, honey, uh, excuse me, I'm going to go out and greet that guy, I know him. And so she went out, she talked with the guy, and after the limo was filled up, they hugged and they said goodbye. As they were going back into the highway to go on, the president said, who was that guy? Well, George, Barbara said, that was my childhood sweetheart. <laughs> and uh, now he runs that station. And George Bush, according to the story, said, imagine that. If you didn't need me, you would be married to a, grass, to a gas station attendant. Now you're married to the most powerful man in the world. Because you met me. And according to the story, Barbara said, don't be silly, George. If I married him, he'd be president. <laughs> I really don't know if that story is true. But I think we got the point. George was thought that it was because of him that became president. But for Barbara, no. Sometimes we think that we have righteousness enough to get the salvation, but no. We have to depend on somebody outside of ourselves. Because as far as righteousness is concerned, only Yahweh can guide us in the paths of righteousness. And when he does, and we enjoy security now and in the future, it will be for his name's sake. That's the introduction. Now we go to the sermon, two hours from now. Now we go to verse 4. In verse 4, I hope you notice a change of tone. I hope you notice a switch. In verses 1 to 3, David had been using the third person. In, chapter, in verse 4, he began using the second person. In verses 1 to 3, he said, the Lord, third person, first person, remember my, my English grammar, I, first person, you, second person, he or she or it, third person. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me, third person. But when we go to chapter to verse four, there's a switch. David is now using the second person. He's now not talking about Yahweh. He is now talking to Yahweh. Notice that, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for Thou, you, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table, that's verse 5, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. We'll talk about anointing this afternoon. Don't miss that. I hope you won't. That's also interesting. But you see, why is there a shift? Why is there a change? Now, some scholars debate about it. <coughs> Some scholars who are so liberal in their thinking said, oh, David was so preoccupied with a lot of other things as he was writing. And, and so he forgot about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and therefore he just changed it without actually knowing it. I, I don't believe in that. 
I believe that whatever is in the Bible is there because God made it to be there. And mistakes, seeming mistakes being done by the writers, seeming I mean, may even be, may even be God's purpose. I observe two things, and there's a lot of theologians who kind of agree, and I've gotten my, the idea from them. Number one, you can never talk about God without feeling so close to Him. The more you talk about Him, the more you share Him with other people, the more you study and digest Him in your mind and in your life, the closer He becomes to you. So just like David, as he was talking about Yahweh, he, the Lord, and then he just forgot everything. Now he begins to talk to the Lord. You see, when you're talking to the person, second person, the person seems to be close by. The person is near you. It's, he's not far away unless you're talking on the phone. And at the time of David, there were no phones. Like to assure you that. And secondly, this is the part of the shepherd's song where David begins talking about his fears, his anxiety, as, as he goes, as the sheep goes through the valley of the shadow of death, as the sheep faces enemies on every front. And David was the one, uh, while he was writing Psalm 23, who was actually being pursued by Saul, his father-in-law, the king, so that he could kill him. Here was a time when he was in trouble and he was trying to seek out God. And so the lesson that some people are saying, some scholars are saying is, David wrote it that way. Because whenever we are fearful, when, whenever we are scared, that is the time when God is closest to us. All of you, I'm sure, have read the poem, uh, Footprints in the Sand. You know that poem? Yes. And as the man observed the footprints, the two sets of footprints, his footprints and the Lord's footprints, he noticed there are times in his life, in his life when there were only two set, one set of footprints. And it happened at the time when he was scared and anxious and afraid and insecure. He was almost dying. All of the trials, it was this time when he noticed that in his dream, there was only one set of footprints. And so he asked the Lord, did you leave me at this time? You know the story. And the Lord answered, those were the times when you see only one set of footprints in the sand that I carried you in my arms. Mm -hmm. David knew that. At the time when he faced death, and danger and insecurity and anxiety that was the time when he saw Yahweh so close to him. Now let me give you a little background. In Israel where this happened anciently but now in Israel when they talk about valleys mm. they were very narrow. Mm. Now in America even in the Philippines what's a valley? Now I, I live close to a valley the Silicon Valley they call it that San Jose and the neighboring, uh, neighboring cities, Milpitas and all of this, uh, surrounded by mountains on the, on the coast and also here on the, uh, on the side of Morgan Hill and Gilroy. And then there's a bigger valley, which is the San Joaquin Valley, where Fresno and Bakersfield and, and, uh, and uh, Modesto and, and Madero, all of this, it's wide. Now in, in, in Israel, because it's a very small piece of land, you can travel from one point to another point today with a bus in one hour. Just like uh, Oahu in Hawaii. That's Israel. Valleys are very narrow. If there's anything, any plain that is wider than 20 feet square, that's already a valley, a, a plain for them. Um, we had the opportunity of visiting Israel in 1999. All the pastors in Illinois Conference went there. And every time our guide would point us to a valley, it was very narrow. Like the Kidron Valley near Jerusalem. The Kidron Valley is a valley where there's steep hills up on both sides. And when you go in, there's always a shadow in the valley. There's seldom a time of the day when the sun, shine, when the sun shines into that valley because of the steep hills that surrounds it. 
And at the time of David, when he leads the sheep, when the shepherd leads the sheep through a valley, there was also always a possibility, or often a possibility, of wild animals who are there to maybe eat and kill some of his animals, or even worse, some bad people, bandits, robbers, who may be hiding there to rob anybody who passes by. And so David knew what he was talking about. He said, Whenever I go through the valley of the shadow of death, because every time he went through the valley, there was always the possibility of dying in the valley. And yet he, being shepherded by Yahweh, he said, I fear no evil, because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. All of this you take care as I go through the valley of the shadow of death. 